Hi, and welcome to Car Corner. My name is Richard Saxton. I'm the coordinator of the automotive programs here at the Community College of Philadelphia. In today's episode, Dan Reed is going to stop you in your tracks with his discussion on brake master cylinders. If you have any questions about the programs here at the college, please check us out at the website. Okay, now it's time to get it in gear. Hi, I'm Dan Reed with the Community College of Philadelphia's Automotive Technology Program. Welcome to Car Corner. Today, we're going to be talking about automotive brake master cylinders. Now, master cylinder is a fairly common part to replace as part of the brake system. It is essentially the heart, the main input of the brake system. It's also ultimately attached to the brake pedal that you step on to actuate the brakes. What it is, is it is a hydraulic pump that is designed to pressurize the brake system when you press down on that brake pedal. And this is a basic master cylinder completely stripped down all by itself. So what it looks like is it looks like kind of like a, a metal flute or a tube with a mounting bracket at the back. Now this back portion here is going to bolt to a large cylindrical device called a power booster. And that is a big vacuum diaphragm. It's usually it's uh, black or sometimes they're chrome or a gold color. And they're usually located right behind the master cylinder. And it's the mounting surface for the master cylinder. I have a couple brake lines that are going to come out from the master cylinder. And we're going to pressurize fluid in here. There's a series of pistons. I'm going to take this one apart so you can see what's on the inside. And we're going to pressurize that fluid. And that pressurized fluid, when we step on it with our foot, is going to hydraulically actuate um, the brake calipers or brake drums in our brake system. So the master cylinder has a couple other components that go along with it. Usually there's a set of rubber grommets. And these rubber grommets sit in this top section right here. They fit right there. And what they allow manufacturers to do is they allow manufacturer to have a what's known as, and this one doesn't go with this master cylinder, but this is a composite master cylinder. This top reservoir, this top piece right here is the clear plastic part that we normally see that we put our brake fluid in. Now this one, it goes all together. This guy sits on top of here. And um, of course, with our master cylinder, we have our level marks. I think right there you can see the, the min mark, which would be the minimum level of the proper amount of brake fluid in the car that we would have. So the reservoir is clear in most cars, so we can see exactly how much fluid is in there. Some other master cylinders, older ones, were a solid cast iron unit, and you had to take this cap off. There was a big clamp at the top, and you popped that clamp off, and you took the cover off, and you could look inside and add brake fluid if you needed it and also see how much was in there. Manufacturers and the never-ending quest for better fuel economy and performance got rid of those cast iron master cylinders probably in about the mid-1980s and we started to go to these really lightweight aluminum composite components and you know every little bit helps in the car and the fact is, is this guy you know this plastic piece of plastic weighs about as much as a soda can and this really doesn't weigh more than a small wrench. Um, so that was a huge weight savings in the car uh, across the board for fuel economy and power. So the other thing that we may have is we may have a cap and the cap on the master cylinder is going to seal out dirt and moisture and some caps have a float mechanism on them like that and that's what's going to um, basically turn on the warning light on the dashboard to tell you that you're low on brake fluid. So anytime you're driving and the red brake light comes on on the dashboard, that doesn't mean, you know, keep driving and think about checking the brakes. That means you are running out of brake fluid. And since the system is hydraulically actuated, it relies on that fluid pressure to actually actuate the brakes. If there's no fluid, you have no brakes. So if that red brake light comes on at any time when you're driving or it just happens to be on one day, uh, you should really thoroughly have that checked out by a professional technician to make sure that the problem is, uh, can be corrected. So, how do master cylinders fail? Well, they fail for a number of reasons. One of them is, is that since there is a series of pistons on the inside of these, usually what happens is, is the pistons fail. And the typical sign of a bad master cylinder is you're stopped at a light and your foot is on the brake. 
and you're waiting for the light to change and the car is uh, in gear if it's on automatic and the brake pedal slowly starts sinking to the floor. It goes all the way down to the floor. And when that happens, once it's all the way at the floor, the car actually starts to creep forward a little bit if it's an automatic and, and it's in gear. And you take your foot off the brake and you step back on the brake and the same thing happens again. The pedal slowly starts to go to the floor. That's because the pistons on the inside here are damaged and they're seals. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop this one apart so we can see the inside of it. And on the back of most master cylinders, there's a small snap ring right here. And snap rings, notice I put on my safety glasses, are notorious for flying off and trying to hit you in the face. And then what I have here is a pair of snap ring pliers. And the pliers are I'm going to use to try to uh, retract or expand that ring um, and then pop it out. And then I'll be able to eject one of the uh, pistons out of this guy and we can see what, what the problem is with this. So let me set this up here. And uh, this is not something that we typically do anymore. Generally, when you go to replace a master cylinder, you just replace one. You get a new one in a box that's ready to go after we bleed it. Um, back in the day, we used to actually be able to take these things apart and rebuild them. So you could rebuild the master cylinder. Now, the reason why manufacturers don't have you do that anymore, there we go, there's our piston on the inside right there. And there's another piston on the inside here. You can see if I can try to get it out. There we go. Those are my two pistons on the inside of my master cylinder. So they would sit, whoops, they would actually sit this way on the inside. So the uh, manufacturers don't have us rebuild these anymore because one, uh, the process of rebuilding them actually requires special equipment. And two, it's such a critical safety component of the car for proper operation. If you really screw any part of this up, um, you're going to have the brakes fail while you drive and nobody wants that liability so manufacturers at this point just basically sell you either a properly reconditioned or remanufactured master cylinder or in my personal preference just go get a brand new one. So the reason why master cylinders fail is because of the seals on the inside of the master cylinder. Now this back piston and back seal this is what's known as the primary piston and the forward piston is actually called the secondary. Now, you would think that one might be more important than the other, but the fact is, is they both do the same job. And the only reason why they're called primary and secondary is because of the way that actually is the master cylinder is disassembled. Um, the front piston always comes out second uh, versus the one that goes in the back first. So um, the part that fails on these guys is this seal right here. This is our primary rear seal. And this right here is our secondary uh, front seal. And then there's a chamber, there's a, there's a piston in between here that separates the two. Now, when you go to step on the brakes on the inside of the car, you're actually driving these pistons forward. And what they do is these large springs act as return springs. This is what actually helps push the pedal back when you let your foot off the brake. Um, on the inside here of the master cylinder, when we compress this primary piston forward, what it does is it drives fluid in this chamber out through this brake line and then out through the brake system to the, to the uh, wheel cylinders or calipers. And again, when you have that brake pedal that slowly drops to the floor, it could be a master cylinder. The other thing it could also be is that if there is an external leak somewhere in the system. So maybe um, you drove over something and you accidentally cut a brake line or damaged a brake line, you drove over a large metal pipe in the road or something like that. If you do that, the reason why there's two pistons, a secondary and a primary one, is because if we actually lose the hydraulic pressure in one of these two chambers, you always have at least one chamber as a backup. Um, cars before 1968 only had single chamber master cylinders, which meant you know, in the old Hollywood movies, you see somebody, uh, you know, somebody cuts a brake line on a car and then their car veers off a cliff and they can't stop the car. That doesn't happen anymore because we have a primary and secondary system. So if we lose the fluid in either the primary or the secondary, this separator seal between the two separates those two halves. So you still at least have half of your braking power. Now, 
cars are big, cars are heavy, and people drive them fast. You know, when you have half of your brakes, you got to realize that your stopping distances are basically doubled. So it's not really a good excuse to kind of drive around on the, uh, you know, the backup system as it were. It's something you really want to get fixed. And most people are, you know, kind of conditioned. Brake pedals feel fairly consistent when you drive. And suddenly when the pedal starts going much farther than it's supposed to or the car doesn't stop as well, most people, you know, they take a time out and they take the car to a technician to have it looked at. Okay, so um, that's what's going on with the, uh, with the inside of the master cylinder. I'm going to pop this guy back together. It's just a, a demo. Um, it's not actually going to be put into service. I'll slide that back in and put my snap ring back on the top here. So, and snap that back and put the guys back together. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the master cylinder in a nutshell. Now the car behind us, um, its problem is, is it, the brake pedal slowly travels to the floor and there are no external leaks. And basically that means that the master cylinder in this car has failed. Now, generally master cylinders are going to last, you know, they could last the maybe 100,000 miles, maybe 200,000 miles. But on some cars, if the car's been sitting for a while, their life may actually be shortened. Those, those seals actually like to see some activity every once in a while. So driving the car is actually healthy for the seals. The other thing is, is that our brake fluid that we have in our cars today, um, brake fluid comes in two basic flavors for North America. One is a DOT4 spec brake fluid, which is typically going to be found in your higher end, uh, most of your European cars, maybe some newer domestic cars as well are going to take DOT4. The old standard fluid, which we used for a really, really long time in North America, was DOT3. And uh, brake fluid has some interesting properties about it. Brake fluid is actually designed to absorb moisture. It has to absorb moisture because we don't want the moisture to be separate from the brake system. And you might say, well, if we have this cap on here, how's the moisture get in the system? Well, the fact is, is as the brakes wear, the fluid level in your master cylinder is going to drop slightly. That's normal. Um, you shouldn't have to really add brake fluid on a regular basis. But because that level drops, what we have to have is there's actually a small hole in the cap. And uh, I have it outlined here with an arrow. I, I don't think the camera's going to be able to see it, the hole that well. But there's actually a way for fresh air from the outside atmosphere to enter inside the fluid reservoir. Now, that's going to help prevent a vacuum from occurring inside our fluid reservoir and allow our brake fluid to basically gravity drop as it travels through the system as it's needed. That's where the moisture comes in. So most manufacturers recommend that every two years you change or flush your brake fluid. Now, when we go to replace the master cylinder on the car behind us, what we're going to see is we're going to see um, part of that bleed or that exchange, that changing process take place when we, when we flush um, basically air out of the system and put some fresh dot uh, three fluid back in. If you're ever curious of exactly what type of brake fluid your car takes, um, the top of your master cylinder cap is always going to tell you. This one says right here, it says dot three brake fluid. Um, says make sure to clean the filler cap before you take it off. Make sure that you only use it from a fresh sealed container. Um, if you have old brake fluid, just get rid of it. It's really cheap, it's inexpensive, and you should never ever transport this in a separate container that wasn't designed for brake fluid. Um, brake fluid can actually damage some plastics. Oddly enough, it's actually very good for rubber, but one of its problems is, is brake fluid eats paint. So you want to make sure that if we get any uh, brake fluid on a painted surface, especially a car, you wash it off with cold water very quickly. Um, don't let it sit. It will actually stain paint. So always make sure that you use the right brake fluid for your car. There is a, another brake fluid on the market called DOT5, which uh, is a neat purple color. And you might think, well, if 3 is good, 4 is better, 5 is even better. Uh, DOT5 should never be used in automobiles. Uh, it's used in some motorcycles and some heavy trucks and actually antique cars. DOT5 is a silicone-based brake fluid, and the problem is, is it doesn't work well with ABS systems. 
So um, dot three and dot four are designed to work with you know your generic uh, ABS systems. The difference between dot three and dot four is the boiling point of the fluid. Um, dot three fluid boils at a lower boiling point than dot four. We don't want the brake fluid to boil when it gets hot because when it does, um, it's going to create bubbles just like how you see bubbles form on the bottom of a pan when it's boiling. And those bubbles are going to cause our brake pedal to get spongy um, and we're not going to have good brakes. So you want to make sure that you use the right brake fluid. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to, uh, to cover here was the process of actually possibly making a brake line. If we have a uh, master cylinder here, this is part of a master cylinder, this is actually the replacement one for the car behind us, um, and let's say that you need to make a new section of brake line. Brake line can get damaged, um, you can buy it in pre-cut legs with different types of fittings, and the fittings are really particular to um, how the system goes together. We don't use any type of uh, compression fittings uh, first and foremost, any type of um, um, Home Depot type of tubing repair that you might see for maybe an ice maker line, you're going to find that it might actually seem to work on the car, but the fact is, is it's not safe. Can't use copper or aluminum lines on a brake system. What we have to use is we have to use a specially constructed um, double wall steel tubing. Um, is specifically made for automobile brake lines. It has a higher burst strength um, than the copper. The copper will just rupture. The other thing is, is while you may see that some of the brake lines or hoses appear to have rubber on them, um, it's not just rubber with like a clamp sleeve around like for a fuel injection line. Uh, brake hoses may have to withstand up to a couple thousand PSI. So we really want to make sure that those things aren't going to break. So when we have our brake line, what you might get is you might get a section of brake line and uh, you have a fitting on the end. You want to make sure that your fitting threads into whatever your, your uh, receiving component is on the inside. And you just can't take this guy and slide it on there and fit it in um, because once you tighten this down, this piece just comes right out. So what we have to do is we have to put a little special flare on the end of our brake line tubing. And that requires a special tool called a tubing flare kit. So let's take a look and see what's involved with setting up a brake line. And uh, first and foremost, what I have is I have a section of proper steel tubing. Now, this tubing is not from a hardware store. It is from an automotive store. And it's from specifically uh, an automotive supply store that is, you know, this is sold as automotive brake line for North America. Again, can't use any rubber, can't use any copper, can't use any aluminum. As nice and pretty as that stuff might look, it's just not going to last. So what I've done with this is I've taken a uh, small bit of sandpaper and I've basically removed some of this outer Teflon coating. Now the coating on this brake line helps it so it doesn't corrode. It is uh, steel and most factory brake lines on most cars made before 1985 uh, may have some corrosion issues. It's not uncommon to have a brake line rot out if you live up in the northern states where they use a lot of road salt. So the first thing that we're going to do is uh, we're going to take a section and if you were going to if you were going to try to match up a piece of uh, brake line that you had damaged one of my personal favorite ways to do it is is just take a string and lay it over the old brake line and then mark it and then transfer that distance over here to our new brake line. And when you go to cut the brake line, we're going to have to use a tubing cutter. Now tubing cutter is really a plumbing tool. And in fact, a lot of the tools that we use to manufacture a brake line are almost plumbing tools. I mean, you could literally use them to plumb uh, very small pipes in your house, like for an ice maker line or something like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this brake um, we're going to take this uh, tubing cutter and we're going to, I'm just going to guess a length here, and I'm going to put this tubing cutter on and I'm going to tighten this down and I'm not going to use this little wheel as a guillotine. I don't slice through the tube. What I do is I just get it snug and then I'm just going to rotate it a couple times like this until it kind of loosens up. And what will start to happen is, as you can see that this wheel is going to start to cut a small notch into the tubing. Now, the reason why we have to use a tubing cutter and we can't just get a pair of uh, 
snips or a hacksaw is because what that would do is that would actually take our nice round tubing and start to deform it as we cut it. Now, the reason why we have to keep the tubing perfectly round is because when I go to actually make the fitting end, the tool for the, for the, uh, to, that manufactures the fitting is very specific. You have to keep that tube perfectly round, otherwise you have a problem. So let me tighten this down a little bit, and I'm just going to keep turning this until it gets loose. And once it gets loose, I'm just going to turn this knob a little bit. It takes a couple times. Now they do sell this in pre-made sections. And for most people, that's probably the easiest thing to do, but I'll show you how to actually manufacture it. Okay, we'll just keep turning it, and there we go. It comes right off like that. Now the end that I've cut right here is, is pretty decent. It's a nice, smooth, uh, round piece, but it's got a little bit of a burr on the inside of it, so what I have is I have this tool, which is called a deburring tool, and I'm just going to deburr this right on the inside like that. Just run that around there on the inside. Try to get some of the debris out of there. I'm still not quite done. What I might have to do with this tubing is I may actually have to bend it. Now, brake lines can sometimes be, you know, fancy shapes or, you know, odd designs. And there's really two basic types of tubing benders that exist. One is this guy, and this is called a spring bender. Whoops, I won't stand up. That's a spring bender. And this guy, what I do with it is I just slide it over the tube like so, and then I can just bend it. Okay? And what the what the spring does is the spring prevents the tube from collapsing back on itself. If I just were to bend this tube without the spring to reinforce it, it would actually kind of develop a, um, it would develop a kink, which would be a weak spot in the tubing. And I don't have that now. I have a nice smooth bend through here. The other type of tubing bender we have is this guy, which is called a tubing bender. And the tubing bender I'm going to put my brake line in here, like this, and I'm going to just bend this, and I can just line up the, the dots, and I can just bend this either as a 45 degree angle, or I can go all the way around as a 90 degree angle like that. And it's designed, again, to support the tubing, so that way I have a nice smooth radius through the bend. Um, if I tried to just bend this, you know, by wrapping it around a piece of pipe and bending it, um, what's going to happen at that point is that it's going to it's going to crease and it's going to have a weak spot, which will ultimately become a leak or a failure. So now that I have my tubing bent, what I'm ready to do is I'm ready to mount it in something called the tubing flaring bar, which is part of this kit. And these kits run anywhere from. I want to say $25 for a cheap kit that you may use once or twice to something a little more professional like this one, which, yeah, it's going to run you around $100, all the way up to like industrial ones where if you work for, say, a company that fabricates race cars and you're making brake lines all day long, those, those type of flaring kits can be several hundreds, if not $1,000 at least. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to take my flaring bar and I'm going to mount it in a vise over here. And this is part of the reason why we have the vise and the workbench out here and not my toolbox, which you're probably used to seeing. And I'm going to position this section of tube right there like that. And I'm just going to snug this down. Now I'm not going to go crazy and make this really tight yet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a file and I'm just going to gently run it over the top of this. And again, I really want to make sure that that tubing is nice and square. I'll put my reamer on as well. Make sure that that is clear. And before I do the next step, I actually take it back out. 
You say, well, why'd you put it in there and take it back out? Well, the reason why I did that was because I needed to make sure that I had this in a good mounting surface. I can't just mount it in the vise because if I do, I'll actually crush the tubing. This guy right here makes sure that it grabs it 360 degrees and doesn't crush it. Now, at this point, what I need to do is I need to put my fitting on. I need to make sure that I do this before I do the next step because the next step is I'm going to make a flare on the end of this. Once I make that flare, I can't fit this fitting over the flare. It's going to be locked in place. The other thing is I want to make sure that my flare is in the right direction. Now these flares can be problematic because what happens is, is it's sort of like a nut or a bolt, but it's actually really weak and they're actually made out of a really soft alloy. And so when we remove any type of brake flare fitting, we actually have to use a special set of wrenches called flare nut wrenches. And I have some over here. This is a set of flare nut wrenches. And what these do is these are designed to actually fit specifically around the openings of our fitting and they'll grab it on several sides and not damage it. So they'll make sure that we don't round our fitting out when we grab it. So it's important to use these one anytime that we're working with brake lines on the vehicle. If I were to take a regular wrench that just has two sides on it, I'm going to put too much stress on that fitting and I'm going to actually break it. So I don't want to do that. All right. So let's go back to the flaring bar. So I got my fitting on. I'm going to take my flaring bar. I'm going to mount it. And position this guy right here like so. And I have this little black cap, which is part of my kit. And that cap is called an anvil. And the anvil has a little shoulder on it. And I'm going to line this guy up right about there. Like so. So that way the shoulder is level with the top of the, uh, of the piece. And I'm just going to tighten this guy down. All right, and I'm just using hand pressure to, uh, to tighten this. All right, and I'm going to take my anvil. And then I'm going to take this piece. And this guy slides over the top like that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my little anvil and I'm going to put it so that little tip goes down inside the brake line, like that. And then I'm going to put this guy on, and I'm just going to tighten this. And what this is going to do is this is going to actually cause that straight section of pipe to start to mushroom. And we call that a bubble or ISO flare. Okay, and that's one type of a brake line fitting. Now, now this tool specifically makes that shape fitting, and then it makes a second shape fitting. So we're just going to come down through here, tighten this guy up. And I don't want to go crazy with it, but I do want to get it snug, and I want to compress that little anvil all the way against the surface of the flaring bar. And I'm going to back this up, and if I'm lucky, I'll have a good flare. And I don't know if you can see that little tip, but that it's now a mushroom shape. And I'm going to pop it out here so I can show it for the camera. Okay, and what I have now is I have this little mushroom shape at the end, and my fitting can't come off, all right, because that is now the stop for the fitting. All right, so that's called a bubble flare. And some brake line, some brake hardware actually uses a bubble flare. The Honda behind me actually uses something called a double flare. So what a double flare is, is it's a single flare, a bubble. And then what we're going to do is we're going to fold this little mushroom cap back in on itself. And we're going to make it a Y shape, like a funnel shape as a receiver. So I'm going to put it back into the flaring bar, back where it was.
tighten this back down. And now for the second step, I'm going to use the same tool I used before, but I'm going to leave the little anvil out. So I, I would have taken the anvil and I pulled it, pulled it out. And I'm just going to use this cone shape. And this cone shape, when I drive it into the head of the um, double flare, it's going to make a Y shape with it. Okay, and then I'll back this guy off. And now what we have is we have a proper double flare, double flare brake fitting. And this guy will probably fit 99% of the brake lines on the road uh, that it's set up like this. In fact, if I take our master cylinder right here, we could actually line this guy up with the fitting on the inside there like that. And what happens is, is that will sit on that tubing seat and when I go to thread this in, when I go to snug this down with the wrench, what it does is it takes the bubble from one side and forces that shape over the other and that actually makes a seal on the inside. So it actually deforms the metal and that will withstand probably 3,000 PSI of brake pressure. Okay, so that's how you manufacture a hard brake line. Um, One other thing that I'd want to do when I'm all done with this before I actually put it on the car is I would want to take some compressed air and I'd actually want to blow a little compressed air through it to make sure that I didn't have any uh, particles of metal or anything like that in the brake line. Some people even like to go as far as actually flush it out with a little bit of clean brake fluid and uh, then it's ready to put on the car. So that's how you make a brake line and that's the hardware that you need to do it. Okay, so I'm going to get this cleaned up, and what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go over to our car and we're going to remove our master cylinder. So now that we talked about the problem with the master cylinder in our Honda, um, I want to show you what's involved with removing a master cylinder from the vehicle. So first of all, when you go to do this, you have to be able to remove the wheels from the car. Now, I'm obviously not working anywhere near the wheels right now. I'm working under the hood. And this unit right here is where our master cylinder is located. You can find it because on just about every car made in North America, it's located on the driver's side and it's directly in line with the uh, brake pedal of the vehicle. You'll see that there might be a large uh, black or chrome or cylinder type unit back here. And uh, that unit is called the brake booster. And that's what gives your, your foot a little extra muscle when you step on the brake. And that's what gives you the power and power brakes. So let's talk about removing the master cylinder since it's the problem on our vehicle. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put on my safety glasses since I am working with brake fluid. And I'm going to take a clean towel and I'm going to unscrew the, the reservoir. And I'm going to unplug. There's two plugs right here. And I'm just going to unplug these guys. And that's just to get this out of the way. And this is just a switch on this car to tell you that when you're out of brake fluid and the, the plugs are keyed so that way you know exactly where they go back. Now, this sensor, this reservoir level sensor may actually come with the new master cylinder or it may not. So I just like to keep it you know, clean in case I have to use it again. Plus, if there was nothing wrong with it, it's good to keep a spare. Okay, so we're gonna put that over here. And then the next thing that I have on the inside here is I may have a, a cup, and what this cup does is the cup acts as a screen, almost as a filter. When you go to open the master cylinder, um, you don't want any trash or debris or even dirt, and certainly not water and certainly not any type of petroleum products falling in here. So we'll pop this guy out <coughs> and put that aside. And now at this point, I'm pretty much ready to remove my master cylinder. Now, on most cars, you're going to want to have some type of protective cover over the fender. Remember, brake fluid can damage paint, and if we're going to spill some, we don't want to damage anything. And the other thing I have off camera, just down by my feet, is I actually have a plastic container that I'm going to transfer this into since it's going to kind of be a drippy mess once I get it out of the car. Um, so let's get started. I got 
two lines on the master cylinder and I have my special flare nut wrench and I'm going to first loosen these lines. I'm not going to remove them all the way. I just want to make sure I can crack them loose without having a problem. In the front and push. There we go. That guy cracked loose pretty easy. Make sure I can move that back and forth. It's snug and then I'm going to crack this guy loose as well. All right. And that came loose pretty easily. Now I'm just going to leave these snug. And the reason why is I don't want to completely remove them yet. I want to make sure that I can get to the two nuts on the brake booster that actually hold the master cylinder to the brake booster. And once I get them loose, I can then finish removing those lines and then we can pull the whole master cylinder assembly off. Got that one loose, and then we're going to do the one on the other side. Now some cars may actually have three or four of these nuts. This car only has two. All right, so that guy's loose. So at this point, what I'm going to do is now that my master cylinder can move freely a little bit from its base, now I'm going to go ahead and actually remove those lines. Now the reason why I wanted to make sure that I get this stuff loose first is I don't want to run into a problem where I have to round something off or I have to get a special tool and I leave the car completely disabled leaking brake fluid on the ground. So now that everything's loose we can finish taking everything out. When you go to remove the brake lines you really want to make sure that you take your time and you don't strip them. And that's where the shape of the flare nut wrench comes into play. It allows you good access and it grabs the nut on five or six sides rather than just two. And I should be able to just turn this by hand at this point. And we're going to start to get some fluid coming out and that's okay. That's part of the plan. And the reason why you see that fluid is because gravity is doing its job. It's pulling the fluid down through the master cylinder out through this open line that I have. And now I'm doing the back line. Just taking my time, making sure I don't accidentally round this fitting out and I don't cross thread it. And that becomes a bigger issue when we go to put this back in. So I'm just kind of wiggling it back and forth as I work. and I'm going to just gently bend these lines out of the way. I'm not really twisting them, just kind of giving them a little bit of clearance. And then I can finish taking the two nuts out on the brake booster, making sure I don't lose any washers that come out for it. Two. All right, 
and there's my master cylinder coming out. And I'm gonna put it in my container and we'll go over to the bench. So we've taken our master cylinder out of the box and uh, what I've actually done is I've, I've separated the pieces here on the workbench. And the reason why I've done that is because depending on how much money you spend for the master cylinder, how well of a brand it is, sometimes literally all you get with your master cylinder is this. And this is really the heart of the master cylinder and you kind of, you take this out of the box and you go, gee, that doesn't look like what I got it over in the car, how do I put that back together? Well, what I've done is I've taken the fluid reservoir off and the little grommets on the inside here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assemble this master cylinder. And first what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a fresh bottle of proper brake fluid for the vehicle. And uh, I just need a little bit. And one of my favorite workspaces is just to take the cap that the brake fluid uses as a lid. I'm just going to pour a little bit in there. And the reason why I need that is because what I'm going to do is I'm going to dip these grommets in the brake fluid and they're going to help this seal when I go to put this together. So I'm just going to dip these guys in the brake fluid, just get them nice and wet. And I'm just going to press these into our master cylinder. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the fluid reservoir and which sometimes you may have to, you may wind up reusing this. So you know, knowing how to remove it and reinstall it's important. I'm going to take a little brake fluid and put it on there. And I'm going to just press this on like so. Now on some master cylinders, the fluid reservoir actually just sits on top. Um, this manufacturer actually uses a, a bolt that passes through and secures the master cylinder reservoir to the master cylinder itself. So we'll put this guy in here like that. There we go. And now that reservoir is secured to the master cylinder. And those grommets are going to keep a, a, a nice tight seal. And when we're all done, we shouldn't have any fluid leakage out here at all. Okay? All right. So now what I have to do is I have to bench bleed the master cylinder. I can't take the master cylinder and just put it back on the car. And the reason why is because the manufacturers of master cylinders ship them dry. So the inside of the master cylinder is filled with air. And if I go to put this right on the car, I'm basically going to blow a bunch of compressed air into the brake system. And you might think, well, couldn't I just pour the brake fluid into the master cylinder and then uh, have gravity do its thing and, you know, or I could just bleed the brakes at that point? And the answer is no. Those pistons on the inside that we looked at earlier have to have every last drop of air worked out of them. If there's even just a little teeny tiny little bubble of air in there, that bubble is going to compress and give us a spongy brake pedal. So what we have to do is we have to do a process called bench bleeding. Now bench bleeding is, is really a pretty simple idea. And the reason why it's called bench bleeding is because, well, it's done here on the workbench. The manufacturer of this master cylinder gave us a brake bleeding kit. Now, you can buy these kits individually. Nine out of ten times they come with the master cylinders if they don't and you end up removing and reinstalling your master cylinder a whole lot on your car for whatever reason. You can actually buy these kits separately or you can make them yourself with knowing how to make brake lines. You can actually make your own brake line tub tubing kits. So, we're going to pull these fittings out and this is a generic kit that the manufacturer gives us and it comes with a whole bunch of different adapters. And these adapters are going to fit into our master cylinder port. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these guys, which these look like these are the right ones, and I'm going to just thread these in by hand. I'm not going to uh, go crazy here. 
and over tighten these. Let's see, I got one there and got one here. Does that one fit? There we go, this guy fits like that. I'm going to take these two plastic brake lines and I'm going to fit them over the ends like this. And then there is a clip right here, and this clip is going to hold these two little lines like so. And I'm going to place this down on the inside of my master cylinder. So that's what the whole system should look like when I'm ready to bench bleed it. Now, the reason why they gave me clear tubing is because what I'm going to do is I'm going to mount this in the vise, and I'm going to fill it with clean, fresh brake fluid. Once I do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an old wooden hammer handle and I'm going to gently compress the back side of the master cylinder and I'm going to look for air bubbles to come through here. And when I do this, I'm going to want to do a full long stroke and I'm going to want to go nice and slow and I'm going to want to make sure I get all of the air bubbles worked out of the system. The other thing is, is once I have this done, I kind of have to work a little bit quickly. I have to work quickly because I want to make sure that when I take these tubing fittings out, I immediately have to transport this over to the car. I don't want this to run dry out of brake fluid. If I do, I have to re-bench bleed it again. So when you're at the step where you're ready to do this, make sure that you have a good fluid motion. The car is ready to go. You already have your master cylinder out like, like we have. And um, you know I'm going to have this ready to put in. So let's get started. I'm going to mount this in the vise. Make sure that my tubing fittings are correct and hopefully I won't have any leaks. Now at this point, you notice I'm wearing safety glasses. I'm going to put a little rag down here in case there's some drips. And you might say, why do I want to use a hammer handle versus a screwdriver on the back of the master cylinder? Well, the reason why is because the screwdriver, if I slip, what I run the risk of doing is I run the risk of scoring the inside of the master cylinder. If I slip while well, I go to compress this and I score the inside of the master cylinder, I'm going to basically put a big groove in it and the wood won't let that happen. So th this is actually just a broken hammer handle that I have. It's nothing, nothing fancy. Okay. So I'm going to pour in my brake fluid. I'm going to fill up my master cylinder. And there's my fresh clean fluid. And at this point, what I'm looking for is I'm going to really look for brake fluid to come through these tubes. And I want to, I want to do this nice and slow and make sure that there's no air bubbles. Okay, and I want to make sure that these guys stay submerged. And I'm just doing this slow until there's no more air bubbles. You notice there's less and less air bubbles. I'm going to add a little more brake fluid. And this takes a little while. All right. And you notice that the air bubbles just get less and less. And sometimes it's a good idea to actually stop and wait a couple minutes and let the air bubbles kind of settle out. But they are definitely diminishing. And I think I got just about all of them out at this point. And 
it takes a little while. You want to be patient. It's not something you want to rush because the better of a job you do at this, the easier it is to actually bleed the brakes. All right, and I think we're I think we're really good at this point. All right, so let me take this out, and we'll go over to the car, and we'll reinstall our master cylinder. So we're ready to take our freshly uh, remanufactured and reassembled master cylinder and place it back here in our Honda. So I'm going to just take my master cylinder and keep a rag with me just in case I spill a little fluid. I'm going to pass this down on the inside here. And I'm going to position it over the two, two, uh, two mounting points on our brake master cylinder or uh, power booster. Take the nut and the bolt, and I'm just going to position one on here. And I'm not even going to tighten it all the way down. I'm going to leave it loose. And the reason why I want to leave it loose is because I want to be able to leave a little bit of slack in the master cylinder to kind of wiggle it around a little bit so that way I can really get those hard lines with the brake fittings installed without cross threading them. There we go. And I'm going to do these one at a time. I'm going to pull each one of those tubes off and out, and I'm going to hand thread that line. Always hand thread your brake lines first, and then once they're seated and you can't turn them anymore, and they've gone in several turns, then and only then should you ever put any pressure from a wrench on them. You don't want to strip them and cross thread them. The aluminum is very, very soft. And this is the part that I want to do quickly. I don't want to waste my time at this point and walk away because if I have the master cylinder run dry, I'm going to have to re-bleed the entire system. Re-bench bleed the master cylinder, that is. Get that line on there nice and snug, like so. And I can just give it a little snug with my wrench. Okay, and then I'm going to do the other side. And in regards to um, torque and brake line fittings, there is a specific torque spec, but I'll be completely honest and say that most technicians don't really bother to put a torque wrench on the brake line fittings. They just give them a snug fit. And when we go to bleed the brakes, um, they shouldn't leak. In fact, it takes very little pressure from that um, brake line fitting with the flare nut to actually um, seal that system up. So don't, you know, don't pull back on the wrench thinking you're doing anything any favors. Just really, I think it's probably only, you know, uh, eight or nine uh, foot pounds, and that, that's all there would be on there. All right. So now at this point, I'm going to finish putting on the other nut and washer on the other side of the master cylinder.
All right, so that is all secure back on there. Now, at this point, what I'd have to do is I'd have to remember to hook up my wires for my uh, reservoir cap. And I'd want to make sure that I filled the master cylinder all the way up to its maximum mark with brake fluid. And I'm still actually not done, because what I would have to do at this point is I would have to go around and actually bleed all four wheels. Now, I covered brake bleeding in a, a previous episode where we talked about drum brakes. So that would be the next step, is to go through and bleed the entire brake system, which is why I have this car on a lift. But I think that would just about do it. And then after that, we would go for a road test after we had a good firm pedal, verify that we fixed our master cylinder, and uh, that would be about it. I'm Dan Reed for Car Corner. Thanks for watching. Drive safely. Oh, you guys are rolling. I didn't know. You ready? Well, I, I, I can't stand here like a stone and talk. It's trash day. <laughs> it's great. I got to do, a, we're going to do a diagnosis episode of figuring out what, how to check some things. Words are escaping my brain. All right, anyway. All right, okay. So we'll I'll keep going? Okay. That's all right. I'm, I'm glad we had this moment. I live for moments. <laughs> I'm going to first take our master cylinder and drop it back down through here. And I'm going to keep the, uh, the bleeding tubes on. And what I want to do is I want to first get this positioned on here just a little snug. And I've made a tragic mistake. I've reassembled the master cylinder reservoir backwards. So I have to quickly pop it off and fix it and then put it back on the right way. <laughs>